Hello. Uh, well, thank you. Um, we started about late 2012 in a rather random encounter with Matthew Herbert, uh, where he was speaking about how he approaches sample-based recordings. And I was attending from my own research background, which is more interaction design. And we were thinking about what the opportunities were to kind of bring those two fields that are on one side closely related, but on the other oftentimes uh, not done by the same practitioners into uh, something that works together. And that was the origin of the Mimistophone. It was only early this year, uh, December 2013, January 2014, that we started working on it. And what you see on the, on, the, on the picture there is what it then amounted to in April, which was the little glowing object in the front there, which was staged at the Royal Opera House. And fundamentally, uh, what we are aiming to do is represent uh, sample-based triggers, not on, a, on, on individual keys or buttons or anything else, but gesture-based. Um, and to accomplish this, we have a 70 centimeter by 100 centimeter latex surface, um, which you interact with by pushing in or potentially pulling out, um, which is mapped onto 32 uh, sensors and actuators. And you can see it up here uh, on this image uh, as what the training phase looks like. And uh, at the beginning of April, we staged it at the Royal Opera House here, the front little object, uh, where it was displaying uh, the physical representation of sound based on a learning and training phase that we accomplished before. But I'll speak a bit about how it was created, and Isaac will go more into the technical details. So, first of all, there are projects that are not that dissimilar, such as Relief by Daniel Leitinger and so on. Um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to make it genuinely open source and genuinely community-based. So we built it in the local hack space in Cambridge called Makespace, uh, and a lot of the people there fundamentally uh, uh, are contributors to it now already. Uh, we use components that can be cheaply sourced uh, and can be replicated anywhere in the world. So here, using kind of our, our C uh, servos that are quite cheap to get, um, laser cut materials that anyone can replicate where there's a hack space nearby. Um, and our biggest challenge actually was what's on this image at the bottom, which are the sensors. Our sensors are incredibly accurate. Uh, they're Hall effect based sensors that go down to about a thousandth of a millimeter. So one of the potential uses of our Mephistophone is that we can actually look at vibrations on the surface and see it as a, a huge microphone. And then once uh, we brought that together, and we still have some issues with some of our, our sensors, um, we started training it. Training is a process, uh, a supervised learning process, where we play samples back to the artist, uh, and the artist, based on that, then interacts uh, with the object. And the interactions themselves are then compared to sound features we can extract uh, from the samples that are played. And Isaac will go into details there. For instance, what Matthew and us worked on right at the beginning were water-based droplet noises, such as this recording, which he recorded, um, and then represented as such in the object. And with that, I'll hand over to Isaac, who'll speak more about the technical details. Hi. Um, so based on this essential premise that we wanted to build something that was not only inexpensive, open source, and possibly buildable by you, we decided to build all of the internal architecture on embedded controller boards made by Arduino. They cost about 40 quid, maybe less if you buy them online. Um, and the entire device functions with only three of them. Now, the external processing that Patrick referenced earlier and the machine learning that I'll talk about in a moment obviously hasn't yet been implemented on these kinds of boards. We are looking at ways to get slightly higher powered controllers within the physical device. Um, these three boards that we do have internally, however, are used to control 32 servos and 32 sensors. And in the initial phase, you can actuate any of the 32 servos based on a digital output from a single Arduino. We've played a little bit around with the network effect that's enforced on the device by virtue of the fact that we have a latex sheet on the surface and the nodes well, independent from the view of the controller, are actually physically constrained by the way in which we've built the Mephistophone. Um, we've also got two additional boards which are using um, analog outputs to read off the PWM signals from our sensors. They 
all integrate into one of two modes of interaction. We either have a visualizer, which is defined by the servos, or we have a haptic gesture-based reader, which is defined by the sensors. Um, the information flowing in both directions is amalgamated into a rather concise open sound control formatted packet, which we can send over UDP. It's able to work with either an Ethernet shield on the Arduino or via USB if the length constraints aren't too great. And this allows us to communicate all of the data that's sensed during the training phase and then needs to be imparted during the performance phase back and forth from the device to an external machine that's arbitrarily far away. Um, what you see here is an early state of the training phase. Everything is connected with USB. We're still at the point where we're sensing. Once we have everything in a computer, we can start to generate maps. Uh, this happens to be an inverted map, so up here was down in the earlier image when somebody was impressing a gesture onto the device. They've listened to a sound. We've timestamped this recording. We've simultaneously recorded the state of every one of the sensors at this moment. From this, we apply a relatively simple supervised learning algorithm. We take the audio, we define a feature set. It could be as simple as just the chroma or pitch classes. In the current incarnation, we're using MFCCs. We're flexible in the setup, so we can actually take any more or less arbitrary predefined set of features, and we try to map them back to output gestures. So the output gesture that's informed onto the machine by the learning phase is a combined reference of the original audio, the gesture performed by an artist, and whatever dimensions have been reduced to. I think at this point, Patrick can give you a very nice, succinct overview of how this can be performed and how this can be interacted with. Yeah, so this is one of the many modes that we kind of envisage in the future of how it can be presented. At the Royal Opera House, what it did is we trained it, and based on that training, we informed movement that that was uh, motivated by the sound on the stage. In the future, what we really want to do is we want to work with various artists to, and this is an example that we're thinking about uh, implementing in any sort of opera environment, where there is a recording that's based on uh, a training session before any recordings that might be relevant to the piece being performed, or even a, a live performance of the premiere. Uh, these sounds are then played back to the artist. The artist then impresses the shapes that he or she uh, associates with that specific mode onto the Mephistophone. And some of the ones that, for instance, came up here uh, in Matthew's uh, instance were these various water noises. Um, and if you try to imagine what you'd impress based on these noises, there are various length samples, but a static representation can be easily established for each of those. It gets quite interesting um, how the artist interprets sound differently and the semantics of sound differently. So once that's done, we have a haptic training phase uh, where once these can be replicated quite often enough and constantly enough, we have a consistent representation of how the artist interprets those sounds. And once that's done, the machine is trained. And then, for instance, in how we envisage it in the future, uh, an audience member can come up to the machine and make any noise into it with an instrument just by singing into it, whatever. Um, and the machine will then represent what noise it heard in the form that the artist envisaged. And what's unique about this is if you think about an opera, uh, an opera singer sings and then impresses the shapes that he or she associates with that recording. Uh, any audience member can come up and see how their own voice is reflected in the shape that the uh, artist would imagine. And that's what makes this project quite special. And with that, um, we'd like to thank you. The sounds are all playing again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and look forward to hearing from you if you'd like to collaborate. We're working on multiple hackathons to the end of this year. Uh, we've recently acquired uh, some funding from the Arts Council, which we're very grateful for. And we have this as an active project running until the end of 2015. Please do get in touch if you want to collaborate in any possible way. Thank you. Patrick Walner and Isaac Herman.